Thanks everybody for coming. Um, it's a pleasure to be here today with the journalist and historian Phil Tinline um, to discuss his excellent book, The Death of Consensus, 100 Years of Political Nightmares. Um, at the Institute, we're always thinking about the fundamental change that we're enduring now, mostly as a result of technology and searching for the right conditions for genuinely radical and meaningful reform. And I was particularly enamoured by the death of consensus, not least because it provides a masterful historical survey of political crises in Britain since the 1930s, um, but because I found it unusually instructive. Despite having studied history myself, I've often been somewhat sceptical of how much lessons from history, history can be applied to contemporary political context, but this book debunked that perception for me. Um, in fact, this book was rec recommended to me by multiple people in policy and politics because of how um, useful it was in identifying how you bring in new transformative ideas. And I often found myself reflecting on what this analysis meant for our work at TBI and policy agendas like ours and what it enables, um, how you enable transformative ideas to break through a prevailing consensus. So as we endure our own unique set of political crises, a pandemic, a war in Ukraine, a cost of living crisis, I think this raises endless questions for policymakers and indeed for us at the Institute through our Future of Britain work. Um, I think there's a lot to be said for about how cons consensus shifts after political crisis and more, more importantly, what this means for improving social outcomes for people. Um, questions remain as to whether it might take a nightmare to proceed to transformative agenda on climate change or how the consensus might need to shift so that politicians can adequately respond to the technological revolution. But Phil, our work is focused on creating new political spaces for fresh ideas and new policies. So tell us about the main findings of your book and what history tells us about political consensus. We'll then discuss a bit more and then open to the audience to questions. So Phil, do you want to summarise some of the findings? Yes, I will. Um, OK, I'm going to stand up if that's all right, just so I... I won't do any TED wandering, I promise, but uh, um, just because then I can concentrate. Um, OK, so these two words, consensus and nightmare, that you mentioned in the title of the book. Um, so let's start with consensus. What I don't mean by that is that everybody agrees about everything. That would be self-evidently ridiculous, even if it wasn't in politics. What I do mean by it is that enough people agree that there is one thing, and this is where nightmares come in, there is one thing that must not be allowed to happen. So whether that's mass unemployment or high inflation or high borrowing or uh, strikes, whatever it might be, if you have a settlement based around that, that sort of sets the bounds of the possible. Where the death of consensus comes in, I would argue, is when that system hits a crisis and it no longer seems to work. And essentially what I'm talking about is over the course of, let's say, 10 or 15 years, you get a shift from one dominant nightmare to another, which sounds very straightforward, but actually it's absolute agony, it's horrible, as we've been seeing. Um, and it's because it feels like there is no way through. People who are set on the old nightmare hang on to it viscerally, they can't let go of it. No new solution seems to work. Democracy seems to be failing, uh, which is catnip to extremists. Everything gets very fraught and it is in flux until eventually, partly as a result of generational shift, also usually as a result of some sort of additional crisis or shock, finally things tip over and we end up with a new dominant nightmare, which seems even worse than the old one, and we end up with a settlement, and things go on from there. So um, I think there have been three periods uh, since the beginning of mass democracy in Britain, around about the end of the First World War, or 1928, uh, when uh, all, uh, all women are emancipated uh, and given the vote, um, that have um, fallen into this broad pattern. I'm obviously in no way saying that history works in a, some sort of predetermined cycle, but just as we talk about business cycles, things going through uh, recession and periods of growth, I think you can see, begin to see now that we're 100 years in, some patterns uh, in how mass democracy functions. So the first one is from 1931, uh, in the depths of the Great Depression through to the end of the war in 1945. The second one I would mark from about 1968, 69, uh, through to uh, the beginnings of the sort of Thatcher hegemony in 79, and maybe uh, really the end of the miners' strike in 1985. And the third one, uh, I would say, begins with the financial crisis in 2008. And if you know when it finishes, please let me know. Um, so um, I'm going to do a super, super quick thumbnail of um, those as, as fast as I can in the next sort of six minutes, uh, just to give you a rough sense of where I'm going with this. And it doesn't sort of seem like something too abstract. So in 1931, we have a clash 
of nightmares because we have a dominant nightmare embodied in the Labour Chancellor, Philip Snowden, who is absolutely, resolutely economically orthodox. We absolutely have to have sound money, stay on the gold standard, balance the books, or the deluge will ensue. He talks about starvation and ruin. You know, we have rampant inflation. It'll be like Germany in 1923. We have to stop that happening. The problem is that unemployment is not doing what the orthodoxy suggests it should do. It's actually going up and up and up, not falling. And that means, of course, that unemployment benefit is also getting more and more expensive. And eventually you get to a crisis in August 1931, where Philip Snowden and Ramsay McDonald, two of the founders of the Labour Party, are so desperate to avoid the old dominant nightmare that they actually split from the Labour government that they've been leading uh, because nine of their cabinet ministers refused to go along with cutting unemployment benefit to get a loan from American banks. But I would argue that that moment, which seems so hopeless for the Labour Party, when nine cabinet ministers say, uh, no, we can't go along with this because the nightmare of you know, little kids looking up at their mums and dads you know, with bread and marge on their plate for dinner again you know, is so bad that it's actually worth risking you know, your supposed economic turmoil. Uh, that basically is not an argument that uh, many people will go with. Uh, people try to raise the idea of unemployment uh, as you know, something that we need to take more seriously. We need to act in a transformative way. But people don't listen to Keynes. They don't listen to David Lloyd George, who are advocating borrowing money, essentially, to deal with that. <clears throat> uh, you know, people watch the Jarrow March and think it's very sad, but it's not enough to tip it over the edge. What does that is another crisis, another huge threat, the worst nightmare, first of, of war, but then even worse than that, as people's logic goes at the end of the 1930s, Nazi invasion. And then borrowing money and growing the state seem like things we need to do by yesterday. And that then reinvents the narrative in that summer of 1940 of what had happened since 1931. So that caution, Chamberlain as Chancellor and Prime Minister, Caution starts to look like complacency. We didn't plan, we didn't prepare, we didn't do enough. Why are a million people, a million men still out of work when Dunkirk is happening? And that, I would say, is the moment when the post-war consensus really begins. I will try and do... Okay. Am I all right? OK. Um, so that settles down after 1945. I would say after 45, not during the war. But you have a new... Uh, consensus whereby mass unemployment must not be allowed to happen, uh, which is fine. Actually, you have a very long period of post-war economic growth, so it's not actually a kind of critical issue. Uh, everything seems to be working in a reasonably consensual way, conservative as well as Labour governments, until you start to get uh, more strikes, more inflation, less growth at the end of the 1960s. And then people try to do things to reduce the power of what is now effectively the new concentration of power, at least as it's seen, the trade unions, but they can't do it by letting mass unemployment uh, return. That would be absolutely anathema. So they try to do it using legislation or effectively deal-making. Barbara Castle within Place of Strife and then Ted Heath doing something rather similar. But that is impossible to make work because it kicks off a nightmare for the trade unions, which is a, you know, a movement that began in great powerlessness in the 19th century. And any sense that instead of <clears throat> sort of muscular battles of collective bargaining and strikes, you're going to do this through law, raises spectres of biased judges that they've got, had plenty of experience of before and you know, conservative government exploiting these laws. They will not have it. When Ted Heath tries the same, people march through the streets with swastika placards. You know, it's, it's absolutely viscerally must not be allowed to happen. And so you get to the point where there's more strikes. I won't go into the details in the book, but there's more strikes, there's higher inflation, but you can't trouble the mass unemployment taboo. And it gets to the point where people are talking about you know, military coups and <clears throat> private armies and breaking picket lines by force, because that seems less unthinkable than allowing mass unemployment to return. The crucial speech, which everyone forgets because he made another one a few weeks later, which is rather unfortunate about the uh, reproductive rates of the poor, um, <clears throat> uh, Keith Joseph makes a speech in September uh, 1974 in Preston resonant location for various reasons, uh, where he says, we've got to stop worrying about the gaunt, tight-lipped men in caps and mufflers, the ghosts of the dole queues of the 1930s. Inflation is the thing that will destroy our society. And essentially, the story of the next five years is enough people coming around to that view, kicked off finally by the winter of discontent, that by 1982, when unemployment hits 3 million, people say, well, that's very sad, but it's not the worst problem. We have to get inflation down. We must carry on. If you compare that to 10, days, uh, 10 years and six days earlier, the 20th of January 1972, when unemployment hits 1 million, all hell breaks loose. 
MPs scream with fury at Heath. Heath, whose own father was unemployed in the 1930s, uh, you know, reverses his policy in order to accommodate it. So jump forward very quickly. I'll do this as fast as I can. Um, <laughs> um, in uh, 2008, you have, well, actually, po let's say just post-79, certainly post the end of the miners' strike, you have a new settlement. Not everybody is happy with it, but, you know, it, it is broadly consensual. The economy is growing. There's broad sort of uh, agreement that we must not go back to the nightmares of the 1970s, just as in the 70s, people must not go back to the nightmares of the 1930s. Uh, so, you know, after the miners' strike, you know, managers' right to manage is reasserted uh, rather brutally uh, in the mining industry, but, you know, more generally, uh, no more wildcat strikes, you have the new trade union laws, but also you have had a long period of mass unemployment, and so uh, there's much less incentive to try and move your pay up by striking. And that settlement works through broadly, I would say, till 2008. Obviously, the government after 1997 is very different to the ones that precede it. You have the national minimum wage, you have much more investment in the National Health Service. So it's broadly happening within the same, I would say, uh, dominant nightmare frame until you get to the financial crash in 2008, at which point uh, a new nightmare begins to assert itself because you now have growth falling through the floor and you have lots of people uh, take, not actually losing their jobs. You, obviously, Gordon Brown you know, uh, runs a deficit in order to try and prevent that. We have a sort of brief return to Keynesianism. But you also have an awful lot of people taking pay cuts, moving to worse jobs, moving to more insecure jobs, gig economy, and so on. And then on top of that, you have uh, the coalition government instigating austerity to try to balance the books. And I would argue that the story essentially of the last 15 years undergirded all the way through by that stagnant level of pay that an awful lot of people have endured is essentially a battle between three nightmares. There's the nightmare of Greece in 2009 when the Greek economy uh, does what it does. Uh, George Osborne is not slow to seize on this and point out that, you know, if we go anywhere in the direction he doesn't want us to, you know, something between that and the 1970s and then, you know, the 1930s will ensue. Um, so this is the Greece nightmare. Um, against that, I, there's what you might call the just about managing nightmare, the nightmare. Lots of people are absolutely uh, at the bottom of the pile, but who are really struggling and who thought life was going to be okay. Not least people who graduated at the end of the, the, the so-called noughties, um, you know, who had invested a lot of money in their education and who were given a promise effectively, which just, you know, turns to dust. Um, but a lot of people around the country as well, older people too. Um, and some of that starts to express itself, less with young graduates perhaps, through concerns about immigration, which you know, are motivated by many reasons, some of them a great deal more negative than others. But that's, that then kicks off the third nightmare, which I would say we might call uh, populist nationalist authoritarianism or authoritarian populist nationalism, some combination of those things. And I would argue that essentially that comes to a head in the Brexit vote, where you have a curious thing where, and this may be controversially, uh, I think that possibly the offer that was on the table in Brexit was not entirely clear and entirely agreed between everybody taking part. I think there may have been a little bit of ambiguity crept in, which is why I think you have the following curious situation. On the Remain side, uh, I think you have those two nightmares, the sort of Greece nightmare, this is going to make the economy worse, we're going to turn into this awful kind of uh, autarkic, you know, uh, decaying economy. Uh, you know, all, these, all three of these are very serious concerns. I'm not seeking in any respect to take them anything other than entirely seriously. And then you also have the, uh, the authoritarian nightmare that if we turn into this sort of isolated island pushing Europe away and anti-immigrant, it will come into, turn into something very nasty very quickly. Both very serious concerns. And they sort of fit together. And then on the Leave side, I think you have this curious coalition of, I mean, frankly, some people who are reactionary, but also lots of people who are very strong free marketeers next to other people who, as I say, possibly interpreted Brexit to offer something slightly different, uh, who want to see a bigger state, who have been through a tough time in areas famously like Sunderland since the 1980s, and don't see uh, all that much benefit from what we might call London in, in big scare quotes, uh, this sort of concentration of power, which is you know double liberal and all the rest of it. And briefly, the economic side of the vote seems to register. But then very quickly, uh, you know, with Theresa May and the phrase just about managing used on the steps of Downing Street and so on, very quickly we're back into the sort of after the, she loses her majority, uh, we're into the uh, sort of frantic paralysis, the sort of inertia frenzy of the Brexit wars uh, for two and a half delightful years, which uh, end with the combination of Boris Johnson appealing to the just about managing nightmare and other things too, uh, with sort of levelling up and, you know, Along the way, the prorogation of parliament, which massively kicks off the authoritarian nightmare for perfectly good reasons, um, as well as, you know, frantic uh, worry about no, no deal Brexit. And that kicks off the sort of economic nightmares, too. Um, and that seems to be settled for about five minutes after the 2019 election. And then we have 
COVID. And then we have the furlough scheme, and then we have uh, Ukraine and cost of living. And just to finish very quickly, I would say that the thing about the cost of living crisis is that pretty obviously what it's done is pull the debate right away in most respects from where people, political scientists included, had said that they thought it was heading you know, in 2016, 17, 18, 19, which is something very culturally focused. That's not what we're focused on now. You know, as mortgage rates go up, the economic kind of pain and trouble and, frankly, nightmares that people are suffering uh, are spreading and spreading. And I think that is what may then become the dominant nightmare, which will open up things we can perhaps talk about later as possibilities. Great. Thank you, Phil. That's all right. Um, that extremely <laughs> comprehensive, but actually timely summary of your book. Um, so to get straight into it, yeah. what do you think the enabling factors are for a new policy consensus to break through? Like, how would we go about creating the new the factors for a new consensus? Well, there's only certain things that can be influenced by any one um, body, obviously. I mean, if it's a, an agreement broadly between millions of people, uh, the first thing is to try and read what's going on as best one can. But, you know, once you've done that, uh, there are things that can be done you know, to further that. So, you know, you can identify it and express it in particular ways. You can associate it with particular arguments. So, I mean, what I was just heading on towards, I suppose, is that I think there are quite a lot of different things at the moment that are all pushing in the same direction. And I mean, I'm looking at some of, you know, TBI's work. I can see, you know, a, a, an engagement with that. You know, uh, so we, there is, you know, not just because of decisions made in Britain. I mean, look at Biden, look at China, etc. A move towards more nationally focused economies, but also a wariness of very long supply chains, you know, after COVID and even the boat stuck in the Suez Canal, uh, a more hostile Russia, a more hostile China, a greater sense that we need to produce in this country, partly for green reasons, partly for energy security reasons. So all of those things seem to me to pull in a similar direction. And you can see signs of that consensus gathering actually long before some of these crises. You know, Peter Mandelson was talking about how we need to do more real engineering, less financial engineering in 2009. That's then picked up by Vince Cable and David Willits. Then it's picked up by, uh, you know, Michael Hasseltine as well and, and Nick Timothy and so on. It's quite cross-party. There's these elements of consensus. So I think if you can identify that sort of thing and then work out what it is that you want to do with that and find particularly a kind of, and I don't mean the word pejoratively, a rhetoric that encapsulates that, you know, I think that is, you know, probably the most useful thing one can do with it. So do you think that establishing the nightmare is critical to establishing the future consensus? Like at TBI, it's fundamental to us that we kind of want to be optimistic, but we still want to shift stale political narratives. Right. So do, do you think it's, it is possible to create a new consensus without kind of scaring people in, with a political nightmare that shifts and shapes what's political, politically possible? Do you know, is, is there a precedent <laughs> um, Well, I think, I think, to be honest, I think it's more like there's lots and lots of things people are scared of already. Yeah. The question is whether there's one that people broadly agree is the most important. Yeah. And I think the agreement is the thing that's optimistic and positive. If you think about the periods when this has been the case, the 1950s and early 1960s, the 1990s, these are times when the country feels, I would argue, a great deal more you know, positive and optimistic than it perhaps does at the moment and has done for the last few years. But the staleness is very important because obviously at a certain point that will start to turn stale. Now, I think where we are right now, given that this has been running, I would argue, since the crash, is actually at a really fruitful point where, yes, there's lots of things that are still stale that are still sort of in the bloodstream, as it were, but actually we may well be heading, I think, towards a new settlement, which will then open up all sorts of possibilities and will feel, he says carefully, optimistic. Well, that is very optimistic. <laughs> the book is very grim until the last sentence, which we'll do. <laughs> Um, and when you're talking about Tony Blair, of course. Yeah, of course. Um, <laughs> um, what do you think history's previous political crises could tell us about the different approaches to dealing with things like technological revolutions and how they might clash with the prevailing economic orthodoxy? Because, I mean, one thing we've done quite a bit here, here at the Institute is looking at kind of previous industrial revolutions mm, mm. and seeing how long it takes policy and institutions to adapt to these new, new changes in the economy and in society. Um, what, 
go, especially I noticed this a bit in the 1930s with shifts in the labour market and Harold Wilson's dad, for example. Yes, yes. So one of the reasons why the so-called distressed areas, which are then renamed the special areas, as though that will help, uh, in the 1930s, so Cum uh, West Cumberland, Durham, parts of Scotland and Wales, uh, are really struggling is because they are where old industries were set up in the Industrial Revolution early on and they're then being, uh, they're then under challenge from, you know, German and American competitors who are using more recent um, technology and so on. I mean, uh, Herbert Wilson was a chemist, an industrial chemist, and that was something of a growth area, but, you know, there's other reasons why that wasn't working. I mean, I suppose there's a few things I'd say about this. Um, one is that, you know, it can go either way. So if you think about computing, in the 1960s, computing is all about Harold Wilson and ICL and the white heat of technology and sort of sensible graduates pushing the economy forward, but in quite a sort of corporatist uh, model. Think about computing. When I was at school in the 1980s, when we had BBC computers, uh, it's all about, you know, setting up businesses and entrepreneurship and, you know, uh, Britain striving forwards into a new sort of almost would-be post-ideological uh, periods. So it can be used either way. Think about uh, something like um, the car industry in the 1960s is enormously complex supply chains, you know, with all these specialist companies making very particular sort of brake discs and so on. So if seven people have a demarcation dispute at one of those factories, it shuts down a whole supply chain. Now that gives power, great power to trade unionists in the 1960s. Jump to whopping, the exact opposite thing is happening. Technology is completely de disempowering a trade union. So I think that one of the things that m might be worth thinking about is the degree to which, um, I, I mean, I don't sound like a massive Marxist, which I'm really not, but um, power and I or power relations and ideology kind of intersect with this. So, and I think this can be problematic in both versions, right? There's a version where the technology and the ideology of the people who are deploying it work together. Now, I would argue that something of that was true with the financial crash, right? For many years before that, you have this absolutely turbocharging economy, you know, run on computers, the brightest and the best, sucked in, paid fantastic amounts of money to generate all this wealth, and it optimizes and optimizes and optimizes and gets more and more complicated until people don't understand it anymore. I mean, this is going from Gillian Tett, you know, who is an uh, FT journalist who wrote about it. You know, people just don't understand what they've made anymore, you know, again, resonances with AI, I guess, um, until it blows up. What happens when it blows up, obviously banks are bailed out, lots of people have to take less secure work, this is where the gig economy kicks off, and again, those sort of algorithms and design will work rather well in an economic model, which is, ends up, I would argue, being not enormously brilliant for the people who are concerned. So that's one kind of problem. A different kind of problem is where the technology is clashing with the way that we do things. So social media five or six years after that, it's an obvious example, uh, where we have a particular way of doing democracy and representative democracy, and social media really starts to kind of monkey with that in a very complicated way. Um, but I also think that if you pay attention to those things, you can make them back into something much more constructive. So, for instance, you know, it's very striking to watch what's happening at, at uh, Amazon at the moment. Amazon is unionising. Now, you know, that is a model which, you know, some people would have been critical of. And it's possible, we'll see what happens, but it's perfectly possible that if they decide to embrace having trade unions, you know, Amazon's not short of money. You know, they could manage a sort of a, a policy in the company where you have fantastic workers' rights and good pay and good union relations. And all of the optimization that the tech brought is there too. And that you create a virtuous circle. And I don't know whether that will happen. I may be being totally Pollyanna-ish, or maybe not, but we'll see. Um, and similarly, I think, with, um, with AI, but I've probably said enough on that one. Oh, no, it's useful. Uh, it's really helpful and interesting. Good. Um, it's interesting about thinking about politicians being able to identify in real time mm. when an old consensus dies and a new one is established, mm -hmm. especially since... Um, it, I often got the impression from the book that a lot of the politicians were extremely unself-aware about the fact that they were stuck in the middle of a crisis because of some of the extreme solutions people were proposing or the extreme mm. positions they were taking. Um, did you find in your work that politicians were able to identify what was happening? Or do, can you name any ways that people have done it in the past? Well, that's an interesting question. I mean, I think, I think to be honest, if you're in the midst of a really existential crisis you don't really have the luxury yeah. uh, you just have to try and pick the least awful option I mean you think about Gordon Brown and 
2008, you think about Philip Snowden in 1931, you think about Sunak and Johnson during COVID, you know, you just have to kind of try to calibrate what the least worst thing is. Now, obviously, there's the, le there's the less fully sort of spike intense version of it, where, yes, I think a little bit more self-awareness would be uh, useful. I mean, I think, you know, I think Keith Joseph is a good example of somebody who really read the long arcs. And I think a bit more of that would be useful. Um, sidebar on that, I think longer political careers would be helpful. I mean, you know, the book is structured around the, the youths of 70s politicians starting in the 30s. <clears throat> I couldn't do that, really, for the latter period, because people's yeah. careers, you know, Rishi Sunak is, you know, younger than me. I think he's born at the end of the 70s. So, you know, his memories of the 70s are entirely inherited, whereas Michael Foote's memories of the 70s. Yeah, that was the one that really you know, shocked me was Michael Foote. I didn't realise he was so active from, like, the 1930s. Like, for me, yeah, he's yeah. like a 1970s, 80s politician. Yes, exactly, but... exactly. He wrote a book called Why I Am a Liberal <laughs> yeah. in the early 30s, which Barbara Cassidy used to rib him about. But, <laughs> yeah, the Liverpool docks and reading H.G. Wells is what turned him into a <laughs> Um, okay, that's interesting. So, I mean, I wonder if, um, like, what would you say is the major lesson for policymakers from this book? So one thing that I took away is just the contingency of ideas and how things like when you mentioned Barbara Castle and in place of strife, like some people would say that if that had been implemented, like you were talking about earlier, then the next 30 years could have looked entirely different. Um, but, what, I mean, what would you say the major lesson is? What would your main takeaway be? I mean, I think, uh, I mean, as a sort of, if this doesn't sound glib, uh, I think sometimes the things that you think are unavoidable might be about to be unthinkable. And sometimes the things you think are unthinkable might be about to be unavoidable. In other words, as precisely as you say, things are very contingent. What seems utterly politically impossible, toxic, can't possibly happen, ridiculously risky, no one will support it you know, jump forward a few years later at certain points in our history, and that's massively changed, you know. Not the case most of the time, and one of the kind of paradoxes about this, particularly with these shorter careers, is people don't remember far enough back personally, yeah. you know. Uh, I mean, obviously, in extreme case, that was the financial crisis where you would have had to have been about, you know, 85 to remember anything quite that serious. But, I mean, you know, even, I mean, how many people working in the front line of journalism right now, now remember the 1970s? There's a few. But I would argue the 70s is way more similar to now in a sort of reverse way than the yeah. 1990s, actually. I mean, the 90s, you know, lots of very positive and interesting things done, but politically and economically, a vastly, and geopolitically, vastly different environment. Um, so, yeah, I think that's... It's interesting because while I think that there's clearly a relate, like, not only do the ideas need to exist, they also need to hit at the right time, I think was one thing I took away, especially when it came to things like the welfare state. Yes. It seems that an eternal... Um, kind of enabling factor in these new consensus was also the element of luck, like these two things striking at exactly the same time. Like, for example, with the welfare state, mm -hmm. those ideas became particularly palatable because they hit quite at the right time, I think. I know they had been around for 10 or 15 years, yeah, but yeah. would you agree, disagree with that? Yeah, I, th I think, I think, you know, there's always, it's like there's always someone who's a fascist and there's always someone who's a communist and there's always someone who believes pretty much anything, right? There's yeah. a lot of us. Um, but that's, that's a bit sort of throwaway. No, I think, I think, so I would say up to a point, I would agree. And I think what it's partly about is recognising the moment, in reference to your previous question, and not just sort of in a general sense saying, wouldn't it be nice if healthcare was free? Yeah. But having done the work. Yeah. And that, you know, is something that I think needs a lot of, I mean, it's clearly what you will do, but um, needs a lot of thinking about at the moment and to try and read where things are going early enough that you've already done sufficient of the work. So there's a sort of contingent ver yeah. version of it where you can kind of make your own luck up to a point. Yeah. But, you know, as I say, the key thing, I think, is not to see everything, you know, only comparing it to, you know, your own period of experience or even worse, looking at politics in the sort of, you know, the sort of sports journalism and way of doing politics where everything is like, you know, who's up, who's down. You, know, yeah. you cannot think straight if you do that. Yeah, you know. yeah I think also it's like a, a very short termist way of looking at politics as kind of doing the... You can't, you can't tell the difference history. between... You can't tell the difference between this is small and that's far away if yeah. you have got no sense of perspective. Yeah, no, definitely. Um, well, that was extremely interesting. I'm going to open it up to conversations from the audience, if they've got any. Anyone? Oh, Jess? Oh, hang on, wait, I think we have a microphone. 
This has been a brilliant discussion, so thank you so much. Um, one of my questions was just around um, how politicians might vie with, obviously, the idea you touched on earlier that nightmares kind of exist and are defined by different groups at the same time. So I think an example that sprung to mind was around the kind of perception that sort of just stop oil protesters, a kind of white, middle class, young people, and then obviously there's got very real short term economic problems. So I wonder kind of how you view the sort of um kind of social and privileged dynamics in the kind of creation of nightmares. And I suppose that was an internal kind of domestic example, but on the sort of international scale, it's a similar question around if we in the West are focused on certain things, whereas in the developing world there's still very, very different questions. I wonder how politicians should approach that. Um, well, um, I mean, yes, that's a very good corrective. I mean, most of what I'm talking about would be lovely problems to have in large parts of the world for most of human history, <laughs> quite a lot of part of our history as well. So, no, I think that's, that's a fair point. I mean, in terms of the, the kind of, um, quote-unquote, privilege of a given group of protesters, I won't talk about just off all specifically, but, you know, um, I think it's, you know... Or, or rather in the context of a protest, which is what you're talking about, isn't it? Is I think what's going on there is you have a little clash of nightmares, right? You have the clash of, on the one hand, I can't get to work because this person's glued themselves to the tarmac. And on the other hand, the planet may burn in 10 years and the person I'm trying to go and see might burn with me. So, you know, and there's something about the kind of enormity of one and the sort of immediacy of the other, which I suppose is meant to be deliberately jarring. But there's maybe something to be interrogated about that. It's like if you can make one a bit bigger and the other a bit smaller, and so they kind of can exist in the same bit of your, your head. You know, I mean, that's, that's why I think, you know, in the end, when I, mean, I keep coming back to it, Keith Joseph's speech, uh, which I'm amazed people, more people don't talk about, um, where he, he talks about, you know, the nightmares of unemployment, the nightmares of inflation, and it feels like he's having the same conversation if that makes sense. But the, I mean, the other thing to say is just about the environment. I mean, you know, I don't actually say very much about the environment in the book, but, you know, I mean, you know, and COVID relates to this as well. But I think particularly for people who are under, you know, 30, 35, you know, the idea that this is what's coming, you know, is clearly, and, you know, also for policymakers who are more senior, is putting an extraordinary amount of pressure on previously held certainties, you know. And I think we can see that in a long-term way having quite a big effect. Interesting. Has anyone else got any more questions? Otherwise, I might pounce. Yes, go on, Kirsty. Thank you. Um, you mentioned social media briefly, and like someone like Martin Gurry, you know, the Revolt for the Public's guy, would argue that maybe or might argue that there's only ever been an illusion of consensus or an assumption of consensus because people didn't have options for expressing themselves in very specific ways. You know, you could vote for Labour or Conservatives or Liberals. Mm. Um, and media was just a handful of, ma of mainstream newspapers or a handful of radio or TV channels. Now people are finding communities that are much more specific and defining their identities along much more kind of sp specific lines. They might have more in common with people living in other countries than with their neighbours. Is, is there really a, a hope of actually there being such a straightforward kind of consensus amongst British people again? Or actually have has it got exponentially much more difficult for politicians to find a kind of common agenda that can find wide support amongst people? I mean, I think it's definitely got more difficult. I think that all makes sense. I suppose my only pushbacks on that thesis would be, well, firstly, that's why, I mean, I do this right at the beginning of the book. I'm very circumscribed about what I mean by consensus. So, you know, all I'm talking about is there's a sufficient agreement on this one thing. Other than that, people can yell at each other as much as they like without disturbing my thesis, uh, is the first thing. The second thing is, I think, uh, you know, if you think about what Britain was like in 1935 or, 19, or 1820 or 1962, you know, um, I'm sure there would have been vast numbers of divisions which were still relevant. It's just they may have been expressed or, or structured more geographically, you know. Uh, you think about, I mean, it's not a, a matter of disagreement, but you just think about the sheer range of accents in Britain that there used to be. You know, so I think these problems sort of shift around and probably get somewhat worse, somewhat better, but I don't think there's been this sort of transformative thing. I'm very, very wary of the idea that everything was fine before Twitter, to completely caricature. Um, but yeah, I think um, that's one other thing I was going to say about that. Oh yeah, there's, there's something curious about when social media hit, right? because it hits in about roughly 2008. And actually, Obama gets enormous praise using Facebook early on, and then when other people do, perhaps rightly, <laughs> not so much. Um, but it hits at the same time pretty much as financial crisis, right? Um, so you have this sort of uh, economic or ideological disturbance force and a technological one to kind of exacerbate it. 
And the last time that happened was not in the 1970s. There's no great big new technology of that kind in the 1970s. I mean, there's sort of mailing and stuff. But TV's been there for 20 years. Imagine if TV had been new at the middle of Watergate. You know, I mean, it would incredibly, or, or the minor strikes in the early 70s, incredibly discombobulating. Luckily, in a way, it didn't happen. The time before that, though, the 30s, you have two new technologies. You have radio and you have newsreels. And as I was, I was telling Rosie uh, before, there's a, a fake uh, newsreel, a perfect example of fake news used in the California gubernatorial election of 1934 that you can see on YouTube called California Election News, where they have actors pretending to be voters. And that period, which to me is still the most frightening that I've read about, the, 19, the early 1930s, uh, I think you could see quite a lot of that sort of disturbance. So I, I'm wary that it's, it's totally transformative. I'm going to have to start giving shorter answers, aren't I? Sorry. Oh, no, no, <laughs> that's fine. I was actually going to ask that question, Kirsty. So, well, something around social media, so give me right. something like. Um, <laughs> oh, Tom? Cheers, thank you very much. Um, what seems to me a very like prevailing consensus at the moment from public finance perspective is sort of an unwillingness to run budget deficits. And that's obviously been bigger than news recently with Labour rowing back on some of their, I guess, more transformative spending pledges. Um, what do you think it would take to actually um, dispel that position that we have to balance the books because you talked about it previously um, when you know it took a war something of sort of um, uh, sort of war economy uh, type uh, challenge in order to, to lead to that but obviously you know things are pretty rubbish <laughs> at the moment <laughs> so I guess I'm just wondering from from your sort of long view what would it take or what factors would contribute to a sort of erosion of that um, of that consensus well that's a very good question which I think about all the time, as you can imagine. Um, I think, I mean, I thought it was going to be COVID uh, because COVID has many similarities, uh, sorry, many differences with the Second World War, which you don't need me to spell out, but it does have certain similarities in terms of the pressure it suddenly put on the state and the sense that, of lack of preparedness and so on as is now being explored in the inquiry. Very similar in tone to some of what was said in 1940. We didn't spend enough money, our priorities were wrong. There was complacency, all those things. I still think COVID has, has moved the, the, the boundaries uh, long term. I think the furlough scheme, I think the talk of key workers and so on, are, are still in the system, but they've reined back quite a lot. Um, you know, it did take quite a long time to get from 1940 to 1945, we'll see. But I do think there needs to be some more, if it's going to happen, I'm not saying whether it's a good or a bad idea, but if, if we are going to move in that direction, I think there are, there are going to have to be some more moves. I mean, actually, part of it may be, I mean, if you think about whose nightmare it is, right? A lot of the worry about balancing the books is a sort of assumed secondhand nightmare. It's if, if this happens, investors will be spooked and the pound will drop and the economy will like to happen with trust, right? Now, that's not our nightmare, those are the investors' nightmare. So if we actually think and talk to investors about what it is that would frighten them and what wouldn't frighten them, you know, what happened with, with COVID is far more radical than anything any politician's ever going to suggest in my lifetime. But it was okay because the alternative was worse. So if there's a way of having conversations, which I think is sort of what Rachel Reeves has been trying to do, um, with investors to say, well, what we want to do, what Labour wants to do, is to very carefully invest for the long term in order to transform the economy into something that, without frightening anybody along the way, without unfunded promises, slowly becomes a more high growth economy again and a greener economy. I think there's a kind of, I think we might look back in a couple of years and think, oh, when did that happen? And it had sort of already shifted. But I'll give you one theory about how it might, which is from the mid-60s, which is you have this moment in 1964 where Harold Wilson makes his white heat of technology speech, you know, all very dynamic and so on. It doesn't actually really increase Labour's vote. What happens is the Liberal vote goes up and the Tory vote goes down, but they get in. We've got a majority of three after 13 years uh, of Conservative governments. They get a majority of three. They govern like they've got a bigger majority. And then actually the Conservative Party doesn't fall apart. It gets a new Wilson-type leader like Heath. But they run again after 18 months and win a majority of 98. We slightly forget this because it then all falls apart by 1970. But it may be that the way it, the way it needs to work is for Labour to kind of be given a hearing, get into government, have that conversation from in government. when They've already won an election, just, and then go back to the country with a somewhat more radical manifesto. It may also be conceivably that the Conservative Party hits the, hits the rocks for a bit uh, post an election loss. So that's one way it could happen. I think it's going to have to be messy because, as you say, there's no great big blam Second World War. I hope not, anyway. 
I'm sorry, I'm just going to come in with a follow-up question okay. on that. I'm you think that's totally <laughs> no. naive? <laughs> no, don't <laughs> worry, I won't challenge the no, no, thesis. Feel free. But I'm actually interested thinking about it, about um, who mobilises behind the nightmares. Right. So in your work, when you look back on it, mm. you know, did you often find yourself distinguishing between this being specifically a nightmare of politicians mm -hmm. or of investors or of particular mm. groups? or a nightmare of the people, or both, because while on the one hand, I think people are concerned about economic stability, they're also very concerned about tangible material things that affect them day to day, like, yeah. you know, bread and butter examples and the just about managing thing. Yeah, um, mortgage. Yeah, exactly. Do they have so, to miss a mail every fortnight? Yeah, yeah, so because often economic analogies fall very far away from the reality for people. Yes, yes. And I noticed this in some of the analysis from the 1930s, but often yeah. it feels like a lot of these nightmares are just being mobilised by politicians. Well, I think in the end, something that's going to really sort of shape how politics runs for 20, 30 years is going to have to be deeply and widely felt. You know, the, the feeling about mass unemployment in the 50s and 60s, that was real. You know, you can't fake that. And actually, I think the attitude of trade unions after the 70s, similarly, you know, people really didn't want to go back to that. And so that, that, you know, that bedded in. You know, obviously, it's different according to you know, whose side the media is more on and all the rest of it. Um, but no, I think, I think it does have to be genuine. I think part of where it shifts and partly where younger generations start to get there before politicians is exactly why, why I structured the book in this way, really, is that if you're a politician in your 50s or 60s and you are absolutely shaped by this thing from your childhood... You know, that's going to lose traction as you go through your life. When Michael Foote is 26 in 1940 and co-writes Guilty Man and absolutely kind of forges this new narrative and sort of sets the, sets the ground running for the next 30, 40 years, you know, it's, he's incredibly current. By 1983, you know, he's still going around the country in the general election campaign talking about the mass unemployment of the 1930s which brought on Hitlerism and all its horrors. And he's like a ghost. He's unfortunately also the leader of the Labour Party. But, you know, he, he's just out of time. You know, trade unionists in the late 1970s, 94% of trade unionists voted in favour of compulsory ballots, which Thatcher had sort of crept towards as a policy. Because, there's, you know, a lot of them were sick of being called out on strike when they didn't mm. particularly want to go on strike. Yeah. So, you know, I think often a younger generation gets there first. And then part of, to come back to your policymaking perspective, part of it is whether there is a really mutually respectful and really listening conversation going on between, you know, a 28-year-old now who has long since given up on any chance of ever owning a property, you know, and a 58-year-old who's got more power but maybe less contacts, you know, and if you can kind of connect those two things properly, which may be partly what you're doing here, um, you know, then you can get somewhere. Yeah, yeah, that's interesting. Thank you. Um, oh, Ryan? Uh, first of all, thank you, Rosie and Phil, for a fascinating discussion. Uh, we've just done some polling for our Future Britain conference taking place on the 18th of July. Tickets available in the TBI website. Coming. <laughs> and the striking thing is that there does seem to be a consensus. About three quarters of the country believe that, in a word, it is shit. And that we are on a path to decline. Mm -hmm. And you feel like this pervades policymaking and political discussions everywhere. Everything is just so negative and so down on the country where it is now, but also where it can go. And it's felt we feel it right when we interact with public services. So my question is, let's imagine there's a young aspiring political leader who comes to you and says, Phil, your book is brilliant. What advice would you give this person for running her or his country when they want to forge a future-facing, positive, progressive consensus? Well, I think the answer is partly in the question that there are an awful lot of things that quite a lot of people really feel like they want done. And if you can carefully make use of that, in other words, not frighten the horses, uh, and say, look, it is, I mean, to, I mean, to take your uh, Anglo-Saxon four letter word, um, you know, look at what's happening right now with the fate of the privatisation of the water industry. You know, it was polling yesterday saying a majority of Conservative Party, either voters or members, forgive me, I can't remember, are, you know, but a significant majority are in favour of renationalisation. Um, that sort of thing, I mean, imagine that 15 years ago. You know, same with the trains, you know, same to some extent with energy. I mean, imagine that conversation in 2007. You would have been looked at very oddly if you started saying things like that. 
like, a, like you were a dinosaur. Um, if you can take that and just kind of embrace it and carefully and respectfully suggest that it could move a bit further to this point, you know, it's all about balancing, you know, the incremental with the visionary, isn't it? You know, you try and just say, well, okay, if you think this is terrible, if you are sick and tired of not knowing whether you're going to be able to get home to pick up your kids from school because you just don't know whether the train's going to run or not, you know, that's so bad for your life that it's worth actually maybe sacrificing something else or taking a bit of a risk. You know, you calibrate it in those terms. Everything is a trade-off between the bad and the worse at one level, right? Um, so what is the thing that you... And you could ask people, it'd be interesting to poll people, what would you be prepared to sacrifice financially or otherwise, risk-wise, in order to do X and Y and Z? And work slowly, carefully on that basis. You might end up somewhere that doesn't feel like it's transformative on the way, but... You know, and, and that would be democratic because you take people with you. It's not about, I think, really important, I think, not to kind of try and do it in a sort of great men theory of history way because that social media really has killed, you know. Yeah. Apart from Trump, obviously, he's doing brilliantly. <laughs> <laughs> um. Um, uh, any, more, any more questions from the audience or no? Great. Oh, okay, go on, Katie. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Um, I was just wondering what, I guess now the kind of like biggest global night we could talk about would be climate change. And I think the global consensus on that doesn't really exist between lots of different countries. So how, and it's a big question of how we'd, we would go about tackling that, but it seems like that is more like an existential issue in the way that like previous nightmares may have been conceived of at the time, but then, you know, after say 15 years, like you say, yeah. we move to a new consensus. It doesn't feel like that's gonna be the case with climate change. Along at least along in the time frames you lay out in your book um, for those cycles. So well, I mean, I I can't tell you how you could achieve a global consensus. That really is above my pay grade. But um, except to say that I think you know there is a basic recognition, pretty widely, I think, that this is sufficiently serious. It may override an awful lot of things. I mean, that is sort of that simple, really. You know, if it's going to be so bad. You know, it's, it's like, I mean, the war is not a bad analogy in a way, you know. Um, it is going to be so awful if, you know, either we just are sort of bombed or we are invaded by the Nazis. It's so existentially terrible that all sorts of things can become possible. And I think there has been a certain amount of that. But, I mean, goodness me, it, it's the idea of how you kind of square the Chinese coal industry and American scepticism about it, you know, is, I, I, I can't tell you. But except to say, you know, that, that it's remarkable what people will put up with if there's something else that's even worse. I don't it, know if that helps at all. I have a follow-up question from that because yeah. I found in the book that mostly the nightmares were around economic or a threat of power mm -hmm. a lot of the time. Um, and I wonder if over the next you know, 10, 15, 20 years mm -hmm. that they might start becoming slightly more social, as it were, like around, uh, like society facing mm -hmm. instead of being on, you know, like the economy or what have you, but something mm -hmm. about climate change, what the NHS might look like. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, I mean, I think you know, I think mass unemployment is as social as it is yeah, that's true. economic. I mean, like I say, I mean, it's that image of the kids with the bread and marge is from a bit of radio archive of a woman saying, you know, the kids would look at me and say, oh, dear, moment, what are we going to do? You know, and it just makes you weep. Um, so that, there is that. I mean, I think some of, some of them that are generated along the way, which don't end up being sort of transformative, that sort of gum up the wheels for a bit, are often to do with sort of authoritarianism, which is, you know, to do with power balances in the country. But I mean, I suppose that does still fall into your category. I mean, I don't know. I mean, I think in the end, in the end, climate change, in terms of how it functions in a national polity, is economic. I mean, I just don't, I don't think you can really escape it, you know. Uh, so I think that would sort of still be part of the process, as we were saying. Um, in terms of um, the social, I think you're seeing it in America. I think you're seeing a kind of sense of mutual fear and, you know, anathema in America in terms of, you know, oh, trans issues or, you know, what goes in libraries and all that sort of thing. I mean, like I say, and I think four years ago, people would probably said the same here. I think currently here it's shifted. But no, I mean, if the economy 
you know, if the economy sorts out, then we will have the luxury of going back to cultural nightmares. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I suppose it's interesting from what a lot of the stuff you're saying, it's making me think that it's, climate change might be one of those things where I'll look back in five years and be like, actually, the consensus had probably shifted much more than I'd given it credit for at the time. Mm. It might be a matter of always thinking, in two years, maybe I'll look back and I'll be Yes, more. yes. Well, it's, this is the ticklish thing about it, is you never quite know whether the fear is sort of, you know, uh, premature or not right or extremely sort of insightful. I mean, yeah. you know, I remember because I'm very elderly, the uh, 1989 Euro elections. I'm very sad. Um, <laughs> and the Greens suddenly getting 15%. You know, mm. it's like, oh, goodness me. I mean, it's obviously a long time ago, but you could see, I mean, you know, the, 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 the Green Party was set up in a pub in Reading in 1975. You know, these things work on very long, you know, timelines. But I do think, it's, I do think just one thing I think it's worth doing is saying, right, let's compare where we are right now with something that is within my memory. Let's go back 10 years or go back 15 years and a series of policy things, say what was possible then and what's possible now. And actually, I think if you do that in detail, actually things do change quite a lot. Yeah, no, I would agree with that. Oh, Harry, go on. Uh, thanks again for, for doing this. Um, speaking of existential threats or potential existential threats, um, I was wondering if we get your thoughts on the current growing consensus around AI uh, and what the effects may be in the labor force. I think a lot of what you've spoken about have been about blue collar jobs mm -hmm. and the evolution that that has taken. Mm. What are your thoughts on the impact that will have on white collar jobs mm. based on the current uh, projection showing that's where a lot of this is gonna be impacting? Well, I mean, I think actually some of the change that we've been seeing over the last sort of 50, 20 odd years or more, you know, the sort of Branko Milanovic elephant actually is already on middle jobs, and maybe, maybe we mean slightly different things by middle, but you know, sort of secretaries or you know, machine operatives. But I think clearly what we're talking about with AI is it going up the scale from there. I mean, I think in the end, it's just unavoid these things that are just unavoidably, this is going to sound really cod, but they're unavoidably human and unavoidably political. You know, all tech is human, I think is a sensible, corrective thought to have. Uh, not always, but useful to try. Um, so I don't know. I mean, I think you know, if it's going to, if this technology, which particular individuals and corporations have created, is going to have destructive effects we really don't want it to have, then politically we ought to be able to decide on that and act accordingly. I think there's maybe a little bit too much of a sense that it's like a sort of it's a bit like COVID, or it's a bit like the opposite of COVID if you're in support of it. You know, it's this sort of rampant force you can't do anything about. That may be me showing my ignorance. I'm aware that AI is, you know, a powerful thing. But I do think a degree of sort of, um, uh, of political um, confidence in the face of radical technological change wouldn't hurt. And I think we've been pretty much lacking in political confidence. So maybe we're unused to... I think if you plonked AI into the world of, you know... I don't know, Ernie Bevin or, you know, Harold Wilson or actually, you know, Thatcher, I think you might have seen a bit more of a confident response. I think we've, we've been so kind of like, you know, been in the sort of political washing machine for such a long time that yeah. trying to think about anything beyond the next 20 minutes is kind of quite hard. But no, I, I don't know. I think, I think just sort of, you know, not, not ceding it too easily, I suppose, is the only thing I would say. Not ceding power too easily. It's interesting, I haven't heard somebody be so pro-career politician for quite a long time. <laughs> um, what are we going to do without them? Yeah, well, indeed, I think, yeah, <laughs> now I'm seeing a uh, benefit to the long-termism of, of being in politics. Um, I've actually got a question come in from Sam Sharps, who ah. told me he actually went to school with you. He did. Um, <laughs> hi, Sam, from Singapore. Um, no, no, from London to Singapore. Um, <laughs> uh, he said, um, are we seeing a strange breakdown in consensus about what was good and bad in the past? There's a weird strain of Brexit nationalism that seems to say it was all fine when we were poor as hell and it never did us any harm. <laughs> when will we poor as hell and never did us any harm? I'm just trying to think. Um, I mean, I think there's, yeah, I mean, obviously history is massively contested, you know, ask people, you know, the ridiculous question whether Churchill's a hero or a villain, you know, yeah. I mean, obviously both and neither, he was in politics for 64 years, you know, so, um, or something like that, but um, yeah, he stood in Oldham in 1898, and he left Commons in 1955, so 57 years, something like that. Anyway, um, I, I think this is part of how it shifts. I think part of it is a contest about what the last period means, so like I say, in 1940, there is this radical reinvention of what the 1930s meant, and it stops being this time of you know, cautious incremental improvement and starts being a time of complacent failure. Uh, I think you're starting to see something about that over the last decade, similarly. And you, know, you, saw, you saw something like that with Thatcher in 1979. You know, this re, you, and, and you see, what's interesting is you see a positive 
reinvention of the previously negative thing and a negativization of the previous. So in the, th in the 70s, um, like I say, you have Michael Foote saying things were terrible in the 30s. You have historians actively working saying, no, 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 actually, look at it more carefully. If you were working in the Coventry car industry in the 1930s, you were doing great. You didn't need trade unions. Your income was going up and up. In interest rates were going down. You could buy a house. Everything was great. Right? Similarly, now you're seeing a reinvention of the 70s. You know, people talking about, you know, Nick Thomas Simmons amongst them, about Harold Wilson, and actually look at the growth rate. The growth rate was better in the so called sclerotic, you know, flabby corporate 1960s than it has been for the last 15 years. So, what was so terrible about it? So, you get this sort of reinvention, but along the way, you get a lot of contestation about that, and you plonk cultural wars on top of that as well, and you're never going to get an agreement. Yeah, yeah, no. but that's, yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, I suppose the perceptions of what is good and bad, I suppose, are also somewhat subjective depending on who you are and yeah. uh, the time you're growing up yeah. and basically rely on a number of different conditions. Yes, I mean, like I say, in the mid-1930s, while some people are like, oh my God, the national government is basically fascist, everything is going completely down the toilet, we're going to have to work out a way to, like Stafford Cripps, serious people, we're going to have to work, and Clement Attlee, we're going to have to work out a way to seize power if we win an election because the, the establishment will come for us. And they're in this kind of incredibly sort of nightmarish world, you know, Lots of people just buying a house and, you know, got their first, you know, maybe even got their first car and their life is fine. Same in the mid-70s. The establishment are tearing their hair out about inflation. Mm. In, lots of people got a colour TV for the first time and couldn't go on holiday to Spain. Fantastic. You know what I mean? There's this yeah. weird sort of dual world. Yeah. Um, and like I say, trying to reconnect those a little bit is quite important. Yeah, that's true. It's an, inter it's an interesting point, actually, like the divorce between... Um, like what, like how like, people's lives are improving quite substantially yeah. Um, yeah. over... And, yeah. uh, and I think conversely, over the last, I mean, I'm, I've been slow with it. Over, I was late with realizing it, even though I was writing the book. You know, if you think about some, someone like me, right? I'm 50 years old, working in the media, living in London, you know, got a, you know, sane mortgage. You know, at what point is all of the stuff that's been happening going to actually come and bite me in the ankle? Well, it actually even hasn't yet. You know, I'm on a long term mortgage, it's fine. You know? If I wasn't paying any attention, I could easily go, well, what are these people moaning about? This is ridiculous. You know, and I think we've seen a very slow shift from that to, oh my goodness, this is actually quite serious over the last few years, partly because people in my trade you know, actually have had quite nice lives economically in this particular configuration over the last 15 years. It's not been, you know, that's why it's hit so hard in the 70s so quickly, it's because relatively powerful people are you know, hit by inflation relatively quickly. Yeah. You know, I think it's taken too long to registered that a lot of people have been having a really rubbish time. Mm. It's interesting, actually. I feel like one of the core themes of your book now, now that I'm really reflecting on it, not that I wasn't reflecting on it before. Uh, um, very thoughtful. Uh, very impressive. <laughs> it's just long-termism, just like teaching politi politicians to think long-term. Not, not the crazy guy. Yeah, not, no, not, not the, the kind crazy. of, in yeah. 400,000 years, that's going to happen, so you have to kill everybody. Yeah, the right? terrible ones, not them. <laughs> um, it's like teaching politicians to think long-term, but also, I don't know, this is an eternal problem in politics, but cultivating like a slightly more uh, reflective citizenry that people that, that people that would have the ability to look back and be like actually things were significantly different or worse 15 yeah. 20 years ago yeah um, and, yeah, yeah you no know, yeah, education systems got better there's much more investment in our societies now where in the past that may have gone into something like defense and actually after the war there was kind of a conscious decision by states to invest more in their societies yeah. than in um in, like i say in their defense mechanisms mechanisms or yeah. what i mean what david edgerton would say that the the Attlee government invests far more in the warfare state than the welfare state. Yeah, that's but eventually that does become true. That's, yeah. <laughs> that is true. Yeah, um, we just need to create um, you know, more investment in public services without yeah. having a world war at the same time. Yeah, point. I mean, I sort of, I just think whenever somebody's really moaning about the state of the country, I just think of a, a bit of Alan Partridge coming into a room with screws stuck to his thing as claws and with a shower curtain on trying to be Dracula and nobody's very impressed and he just goes, oh, this country. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you know, to what extent is it just you or, you know, you've got the state of your knees, you know, if your knees yeah. are feeling awful, is that how you feel about the country? Yeah. There is, you know, a little bit of um, creative perspective and that's why I think respectful peer-to-peer -peer conversations between people are significantly, f you know, distant in age, particularly at the moment given the state of things like the mortgage market. It's really important because it's so easy. I mean, you know, given what you were saying about, you know, social media and bubblification and so on, to have conversations, you know, with... And, you know, maybe the, the whole working from home thing has not totally helped that, mm. you know, actually. I mean, much as I'm fine with it. I think, you know, talking to your colleague who got through the pandemic in a two-room flat more often is good if you got through the pandemic in a lovely four-bedroom house with a garden because you're 
older and got a mortgage. Yeah, that's, that's actually a really interesting takeaway around kind of intergenerational communication to kind of <clears throat> work out yeah. points of consensus and nightmares between, not only to identify it between different people, but notice how things have changed yeah. and what were the inflection points and how you got there. Um, yeah. Yeah. Like, I, you know, I, m m I'm sure they won't mind me. I hope they're listening. Hi, mum and dad. But um, <laughs> <laughs> I think they... That, if they were born in today's education system, they would have definitely ended up at university, very intelligent people. Right. Um, and talking to them about it makes me realise just how far things like that have come. Yeah. Um, and it's an insight that you don't really get unless you're communicating across the generations, which I think comes across in even discussions about climate change and yeah, things yeah, like that. Yeah, yeah. Now my, my, one of my foundational, foundational things is that my mother's mother loved history and would have loved to go to university and specifically told by her father that girls don't go to university. And that absolutely shaped my mum's attitude. She was a teacher for her whole career. I think she's watching. Um, <laughs> Hi, everyone's mum. But, yeah, exactly. but, um, but, you know, and that's one of the reasons these things have a long... I mean, that, when was that decision made? She was born in 1923. That was a decision in the mid-30s, mm. right? Or late-30s. Yeah. And that's absolutely still ingrained in me that there's no way that that would ever be acceptable. I think my inner historian is now coming through and just, Excellent. you know, history is a sign of progress, guys. Exactly. Um, <laughs> Tradition but, is not conservative. Yeah, exactly, exactly. You can definitely tell I've studied history now. I feel like I'm <laughs> reverting back to my student <laughs> days. Um, but I think we've come to the end now. So thanks, everybody, for joining. Thank you, Phil, for coming. A very insightful conversation. Thank you for having me. Um, and it's really helpful for hopefully many future politicians in this room. <laughs> who um, may be making just, you know, doing the equivalent of Barbara Castles in place of strife in 20 years yeah, or yeah. 30 years yeah. or 10, if they're going to be career politicians. Watch out for Jim Callahan if Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, thank you everybody for coming and thank you everyone that joined online. Um, and please go out and buy Phil's book because it's really um, quite an instructive and excellent book, uh, insight into how history can affect long-term decisions. So yeah, that's it. Thank you. Thank you.